episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring people. I love to have deep dive conversations with them, not just about their successes, but more important about the road they traveled to get there. Now, our guest this week, he has a very non-conventional career and I read about his story and I saw a few interviews on him and I was just struck by the fact that you don't have to go the traditional way to make a great living working for yourself. He's in the vending machine business. Actually, he's known as the vending machine king. Please welcome to this week's Power Move Maker series, Mr. Kashif Edwards. Kashif, hey, how you doing? How you doing, man? Glad to be here. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks for taking time out, you know, to really share your story with our audience. I think your story is amazing. I think you have a lot of gems that you could potentially drop on our audience. So I just want to get right into it. You were more of an athlete than a businessman, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most definitely. I played basketball. Um, high school, college, uh, the college with division one level. So I was definitely, you know, always in the, in the sports. I didn't get into like the business stuff until like later down the line. What school did you play at? High school, I went to MOTEP Charter um, in Philadelphia, which I think they're currently like ranked top five in the nation. Oh, they were, but for this whole, for this whole thing happened. <laughs> and then um, college, I went to Niagara University, and I went to Northeastern University in Boston. What position? A uh, small forward. Okay, so you had your dream set on going to the NBA? Honestly, no, no. That my mine was. A, I'm a little weird, man. I never really wanted to go to the NBA. I didn't. I didn't grow up playing basketball. I actually didn't start playing until like tenth grade. Like ninth, tenth grade, I started playing when I was in high school. Um, just because I had some friends that was playing, and I was, I was always tall and athletic, so they kept trying to get me to play. But mm -hmm. I was just more into hanging around outside. Like, but once I started playing, like it just started, you know, it just, you know, my, I just pretty much took off with it, and I kept going, you know, landing me where it landed me. And um, yeah, like I never really wanted to play in the NBA. That wasn't really my goal. I just wanted to be, to be good. Like that's that's pretty much what it was. So, so was this a skill set? Because people literally play all their life. They start out playing young. To make it to a D1 college team, you had to be naturally gifted. Yeah, I would say that. And then I just, like, you know, a thing about me is I got a work ethic. Like, so I, I definitely more, more, than, more than likely, you know, without my natural ability, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Like, so I was very, like, athletic naturally. But then I would always, like, um, just put in extra work. So I'll come, I'll come to school early and do workouts. I'll stay after practice, do workouts. Like I was, you know, that type of person where I was just putting in extra time, you know, so I was able to like catch my skill up to my athletic ability. And then, you know, that's when it started really uh, taking off for me with the basketball thing. So you never had the, the, the normal aspirations of a kid who played ball. Everybody wants to go to the NBA. What did you want to do with your life? Honestly, man, I didn't have any plans. I just was, I just was out here. Like, so and I think when the, when the sports came, it kind of gave me, it gave me goals. Like it gave me goals and it helped me see um, another side of myself. Like I didn't even really know it was there. So, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad it happened. You know, it's, it's interesting that you said you were just out here. And that's uh, one of the big reasons that I wanted to bring you on the show today, because so many people they're just out here. They don't have plans. They want something more out of life. They just don't know what it is. So, the, you know, I love to go into to my guest backstory because not everybody is laser focused and they have this dream from day one and they know what they want to do with their life. Some people pick it up later, but they've always had a work ethic. It's just, I don't know what to, to put my work, my work ethic toward. So I'm glad that you pointed that out. What'd you major in? My major was uh, sociology, and then my um, I went to grad school. Grad school, it was uh, sports management. 
So you went to grad school? Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Good for you. So you graduate. Now you have a, a, a bachelor's and a master's degree. What are you doing with your life? You go into the workforce, I'm assuming. What are you doing? All right. So my first job out of school, I was working in like a mail. It was like a mail room. Just sorting out mail. Um, this was like in Niagara Falls when I, because I went back there, because uh, I had a daughter out there. I went back out there, stayed out there for a while. I did the mail thing for a couple of months. And then I saved up money, and then we moved over to Philly. Um, and then Philly, I, I did a little marketing, but for the for the most part, I was working with. Um, I got my I got my real job like working with kids and you know doing that type of thing. And you was doing that in Philly when you got back home. Yeah, so I, I did I did the marketing. I did marketing for a while, which is I learned a lot of skills doing marketing. Um, this is how, how it really helped me like down the line when I started doing like my own you know business stuff. But um, yeah, I did the marketing for a while for a sports for a sports company um, over here. It was like a startup company. It didn't last too long. Um, and then after that, I got into working with troubled youth. Like, and that's pretty much where was what you know what I what I did up until the point where I stopped working. You know, it's interesting. You and I got a very similar background. Obviously, um, I made my career in marketing products. Um, from started with records and went to just corporate brands, marketing anything. And um, before I did that, I worked with um, in, so, in in the social work field, um, working with adolescents and troubled youth. So we could, we could definitely got a lot in common. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a job right there, man. Social workers. That's whew, that's a lot. Yeah, you got to have your heart in that one. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, are you still playing ball in your spare time or, you know, you're out of school, you're working, you're taking care of your daughter, you're taking care of your family, and you just say, you know what, sports is a thing of the past and I'm done? Or did you do it just for kind of physical activity? All right, so it was like, so when I stopped, I stopped cold turkey. Like, I didn't, I didn't play for, like, a year or some change, which is hard because I, you know, I was so programmed to playing like every day. Um, but now I do play like on my spare time. And it's mainly, it's mainly because I, I got, I had, a, I had a kids like, you know, so I just want to be, I want to be good long enough to beat them. when they get <laughs> And then after that, like, you know, I, I don't care, but I just got to be able to beat them for some time. And then once they get to the point where they, you know, about to go to college or something, I could take, I could take a loss, but I'm not, you know, I got to stay ready into that point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tell me, you're in social work. Where does the vending machine business come into your life? Is this something that you always dreamed of? Did you know somebody who was in the business? How was it even introduced to you? So, um, so mainly when I, when I was younger, you know, with the basketball thing, we had practice at recreation centers all the time. Like, so the majority of our practice at rec, rec, rec centers um, my school was a new school at that time. We didn't have a gym. Mm -hmm. So all our practices and stuff were at, at different rec centers. Um, and on the weekends, we had practice at this one rec center. Um, it had a, you know, Gatorade machine in there. So on, the, on, on that day that we had practice, uh, it was a lady who will always come and replenish the machine. So she'll come put more Gatorades in there. It was a snack machine too, but she, I always remember her from the, remember her from the Gatorade machine because that's where I was, I was sitting there. But she would come and put Gatorades in there and then collect the money, you know, and I'll just be sitting like right in front of her, like, you know, and I seen like how much money she would take out every week. I was like, damn, them machines be making, making some okay money. Like, so <laughs> it was always in the back of my mind, like, you know, I wanted one of those machines. And then, you know, as I, when I got older and started working and I was looking for, for ways to basically, um, get out of work, like, you know, or at least make extra uh, additional money, like on the side of work, you know, the vending machine thing popped back into my head, and that's when I started, like, pursuing it. Question for you. Was any part of you ever wanting to be an entrepreneur? I would say yes, but I didn't, but I didn't know what it was. Like, so I know, I know a big part of me wanted to um, you know, work for myself, especially if, especially if I had a family, I just wanted to be home more because I, I was working so much. And especially you might notice too, like if you did like, you know, to work with the kids, like it requires a lot of your time. It does, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So I, I was really like out a lot. So I, I really wanted to 
create an income for myself. So just so I could be home more mainly. Yeah. So I would say it was always like in the back of my mind, but it wasn't until like later on I actually started it. Okay. So you're looking, you're, you're, you're working a full-time job and you're looking for a way to make extra income. Obviously you could have took it, taken a second job, but I'm assuming you're thinking to yourself, I want to make more passive income money while I sleep. Mm -hmm. Is is that your mindset? No, not at that time. No. So really? I actually, I did, I did take on a second job. My, my mindset more so was at that time I was looking, I really wanted to get into real estate. I wanted to get into flip a house, but I didn't have enough money. I didn't have any credit. I didn't even know what credit was until I graduated school. And by the time I found out what it was, my credit was already bad. Like, so it was like, yo, like what I'm going to do. And that's, you know, and I started, I started thinking of the vending machine thing. I was like, all right, I'm going to get a second job. Then I'm going to try to um, save up enough money to get a machine. I'm going to work the jobs and I'm going to take the money that I'm making from the machine, flip that money. And then to, to I get enough to actually fix my credit, get into the real estate game. And that kind of was my plan. It just didn't go that way. I mean, it did, but not as fast as I thought it would. So the vending machines was kind of a means to an end. Your ultimate end was was real estate. Right, right. When I started wow. that, that, yeah, I was really just trying to get into real estate, but then the machines kind of took on a life of their own, like, and I kept going with that. Okay, so your motivation for, for even – um, kind of becoming an entrepreneur was family. Like you, you. I want to spend more time with my family. You know, I got a family now. I, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time at work. I got two jobs. I got to figure something else out. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to be home more, more than anything else. Got you. And, and I love to hear these kinds of things because when we we all have different motivations, no matter what it is. Now you have to become resourceful. You have to dig deep. You have to figure out, okay, I know what my end goal is. How do I reach it? Right. So in your case, you start with these vending machines. Do you start with huge vending machines or do you start with the smaller ones? So for my case, I only had about $400. So I, um, and I actually saved, you no, know, to start that to back a little further, I actually saved up, I saved it about 3,500. Um, and then I, I purchased my first machine. I found a company that um, that gave you, it sold you a machine with the location. Okay. So they, found, they found me a, a hotel downtown in Philly and they sold me a machine to go in there. So I'm like, great, like sounds like a good spot. But then when I went to go actually visit the location, I'm looking around like, you know, the guy's telling me where you want the machine. I'm looking like, ain't no vending machine going to fit right there. So I called the company and they like, well, we've been doing this for 20 years. We're telling you it's going to fit. I'm like, okay. And then they came all the way from Maryland, I think it was, which was an hour, some two hours maybe away. Um, got the machine there, it didn't fit. So that was kind of my first whack at it. Uh, off of that, I just got my money back. And then I tried again. I approached the rec center, um, another rec center that I, I used to go to. They didn't have a machine. Everybody would have to always run to the corner store, which is like four or five blocks away, which is far from where I, you know, for where I stay in Philly. You know, we got corner stores almost on every corner. So um, I approached them about having me place a machine in there, but then they ended up putting a machine in there themselves. Like when they heard my idea, they was like, oh, well, we could just put one in there. Like So they, they kind of staked me on that. Um, this is the same company? Huh? No, no. So after I tried the company, I tried to do it myself. So the company tried to put it in a hotel. It didn't work. So I got my money back. So mm -hmm. I was like, fine, I'm just going to find my own location. Yep. So I approached, the, I approached the rec center. And then they, when I approached them about it, they liked the idea, but they decided to buy their own machine. The rec center actually liked the idea and put their own vending machine in? They put their own vending machine wow. in there. So at that point, I just got turned off from it, and then I was like, "Man, whatever." Um, then I kind of, I kind of put it to the side, and then the money that I saved obviously started dwindling down. And like, and I had about five, five or four hundred dollars left, and I was like, "You know what? I want to take another whack at it." Um, and I brought uh, what we call like gumball machines. So I brought like four them old school brought, gumball machines with yeah, the big yeah. round. Right, right. So I brought four of those. Um, with four hundred dollars? No, so not the big. You're talking about like the wizards. The wizards are like the big globe, and they got the thing that spiral down. Uh huh. Yeah, I brought um, they were more so like the try, the the try, the try, the try head thing. So it's like three, 
three canisters in this candy in each canister. Yeah, so with like four hundred dollars, I brought I brought four of those, like hundred dollars a piece. Really? Yeah. So can, can we stop here because it's a couple of things I want to pick up on just for my audience, anybody who's listening, who's interested right. in getting into this business. You spoke about getting your first machine, right? From a company uh-huh. that that you can buy it from. They also give you a location. Number one. Yeah. How did you find this company? Like, if, if I tomorrow wanted to find out how can I get into this business, where do I go? And number two, how did you even know how much to save? Did, did you call them first? They told you how much these machines cost, and then you saved up, or did you have a set number in your mind? No, I just was saving as much as I could save. It wasn't no real uh, set number, but when I, after, I, after I saved up, you know, a few thousand dollars, that's when I started looking for like actual, I wasn't even looking for that company. I was just looking for vending machines. So I was on Craigslist. So I went to Craigslist, went into business, and I searched vending machine company. So and that's when I found I found that uh, company who was doing that service at that time. And then gotcha. I also found people just selling like you know regular men, vending machines on there. So if if I wanted to, if tomorrow I decided I want to start a vending machine business, I can literally go to to services like Craigslist and punch in vending machines, and there's there's going to be a number of um, companies that would sell me not only the machine but also locations. Nah, 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 nah. So it's you'll find most most of the time, nine times out of ten, you're going to find um, somebody selling a machine. They might be. They might have a machine in their in their garage or something like that. You know, maybe they somebody left a machine somewhere. You know, they got a storage unit. Maybe they brought a storage unit. There was a machine in the storage unit. You'll find stuff like that. But for people to be selling location with the machine, that's like rare. Okay. But yeah, that, that doesn't happen too often. Okay. Let's fast forward a little bit. Now you buy four of the smaller gumball machines. Right. Where'd you buy them from? Same place, Craigslist. Same place, Craigslist. Individual yeah, was, dealer was, or company? It was a, a, a this is a person selling them. So a he, he, yeah, he was he had a route which is like he had multiple locations with the machines, but he was moving, so he was selling off the machines. Um, so I ended up I ended up buying four of his machines. He had like twenty something of them. Okay. Um, I guess before we even move forward, you're buying a used machine. Right. Again, if somebody's watching this, they're wanting to get into your business, is it safe to buy used machines? Uh, should they go test them out first? Like, what is your recommendation on even buying these types of machines from somebody who might have these machines sitting in their storage um, warehouse for years, or maybe they're in use, but people vandalize them, so forth and so on? Like, what's your recommendation? Because I know, I'm assuming you, you got your $400, you want to get back in the game, you bought them, but obviously over time you've learned something right. uh, about how to proceed. I would say if you're, I, I don't get new machines. I don't I don't really buy new machines, but some Even to this buy, day? No, I don't buy new machines, nope. So what we do is like, even with the vending machines, so... It, some people do, but if you do, like, that's that's your niche. Like, so if that's your niche, that's, like, you, you're going to use that as your pitch when you're approaching these locations and you're trying to get them to accept your service, right? So some people just use the newest equipment, hey, to say, hey, we got the newest equipment, top of the line, whatever, whatever, and that's how they approach it. I, I, I use used machines, and I'll just put upgrades on them. So I might get a machine for $1,000, and then I'll take – um a couple extra dollars and put a card reader on there, add some lights, make sure the paint is clean, and then it's just going to look just as good as the, the new machine and it's going to, fun- as long as it's functioning the same, it doesn't really, you know, make a difference. As long as it's working and then collecting money and delivering my products, it's, it's cool. Like, so. That's such great information because I'm th- obviously technology changes. I'm thinking yeah. in order to stay up with the, the, the world, as technology is changing, you have to have the newest equipment. I didn't realize you can buy parts and keep adding on to this thing. Right, right. Yeah, you definitely, you just bought it. You just, you're right, though. You do have to keep up with the technology, but you could, 
you can literally just, it's like plug and play. You just put it on there, hook it up, and then, you know, you got the newer stuff on a, a older model machine. Okay, so let's go backwards again. You get these four gumball machines. You're not uh -huh. even at vending machines yet. I'm assuming these yeah. are little gumball, you stick a quarter in, and you keep it moving. Where, number one, now you got to find location because the person who you bought it from, I'm assuming, did not give you a location. So what is the process of going out there and finding a location? And then tell me from those little gumball machines, how much can a person make? All right, so the process of finding a location is pretty much, it's real similar to like with the vending machines, but the gumball machines are, are a lot easier because you know they, they you can move them so easily. So what I did was when I got one, um, when I got like my, uh, my machines, first thing I did was network, of course. So, you know, a lot of people knew me from sports. So I reached out to all my resources as far as my networking resources and I let people know what I was doing. Off of that alone, I, I placed two two machines. So I put one in a recreation center, um, which was a rec I was cool with, and I ended up putting another one in like a, a a pizza shop. So I got those two in there, and after that, I pretty much I would I would pick a day. You know, whenever I had a, a day off, I put them in my um in my car, and I just drive around. I'm driving around looking for somewhere to put it. I find a I find a spot. I approach them. I had a little pamphlet. Um, I approach them, to let them know what I was doing, give them my pamphlet. If they wanted, if they was interested, I unload it right there, bring it in there, boom, and there and there there, there it is. Like so, that's pretty much how I did it with the with the gumballs. Um, but as far as the, how much they made, I would say on average, a good one would make about fifty dollars a month, right? The best one I had when I was doing it did about one twenty. It was like one hundred twenty dollars a month. Could, those little machines can hold one hundred and twenty dollars in 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 quarters. quarters. Yeah, really? heavy, heavy, heavy too, man. And you carry them quarters. <laughs> yeah, you break all types of bags. Like you got to get the right type of bags. Yeah, so I built I built that up to I had about twenty. 20 machines when I sold it. I had about 20-something candy machines. Hold on. You had 20-something of those little gumball machines? Yeah, so I built it up to what it was doing around 1000 a month off of the gumball machines. Wow. Okay, I'm assuming you're making $1,000. You're starting to see the possibilities. Like, whoa, you know, yeah. I, I can't quit my job. I got a family, but it's a little money I'm making over here. This is $1,000 wow. that all I got to do is go and – Drop a few gumballs in in each of these machines every week, and I'm good. Once a month. Once wow. A month. Well, they did it monthly, but it was I'm not gonna lie, man. It was it was tough because you know some of my spots was in wrecks, and you know I'm so used. My mind is still like, yo, man, you gotta get in the gym, you gotta get some shots up. I wanna play basketball, but it's like you know, my uh, my brain is like, man, you gotta focus and do what you're doing. Cause I'm in the wrecks and I'm seeing the guys I used to play ball with. They in there, they getting shots up, they they playing. I'm just in there messing with a gumball machine, and I gotta go to my next spot. Then I gotta go to work, like you know what I'm saying. So it was it was hard to stay disciplined. I'm not gonna lie, because I really just wanted to do the stuff that I like to do. Like, but I had to really stay focused on you know build what I was trying to build. So let me ask you is. Asked, I mean, it begs the question, how much time was this taking? Let's, let's go to when you have 20 machines. Because mm -hmm. obviously, if you got one, two, three, four machines, it, it can't be that much time. You go, you yeah. buy your product, you dump it in, and you keep it moving. You do that once a month. 20 machines, how much time is coming out of your life? I would say out of the week, I could do the whole thing in about two days. Got gotcha. you. It's not, not going to take long at all. Honestly, and if I wasn't, if because I was working a lot, like so, if I wasn't working, like if I only worked one job at that time, it, I I probably could have did it a little. I probably could have did it all in one day, but I would have to wait because you know when you're when you're doing two jobs, I never had a four day off, like because my jobs was kind of, you know, one was like Monday through Friday, other one might have been Wednesday through you know whenever. So on on one of the days when I only had to do one one job, whenever I got off, I would just go and do the machines, like so. If I had that whole day, I probably could have did the whole thing in one day, honestly. It just would have took a few hours. Got it. So two days are coming out your life. It's not that bad. 
you're making an extra thousand dollars on the side when do you graduate to vending machines and for, for anybody who's listening explain the difference. I know this sounds like an elementary question but explain the difference between the gumball machines that you started out with and the vending machines all right so just for the difference, I would say the main difference uh, is like the the gumball machines only accept coins and it's only spitting out candy, right? So you're just spitting out like what is Mike and Ike Skittles, you're getting a handful of candy. Whereas the vending machines, people are putting dollars in there and it's producing um, like packs of products, whether it be honey buns, chips, and then you also got, you know, your beverage machines that could do sodas and that type of thing. Um, and I would say the point when I graduated was I was buying the candy, like like five or six of the candy machines I brought from the same person, right? So the guy, when I was purchasing on, on the last one I brought from him, he was like, why don't, you, why don't you do vending machines? I'm like, nah. And at this point, I'm comfortable with just doing the candy machines. I just go, you know, like I said, I go once a month. It takes a couple days and I'm done. And, you know, when I'm thinking about the vending machines now, I'm like, man, I got to carry sodas. I got to, it's just more work. Like, I'm already working a lot. I don't want to do no more work. Um, but he ended up talking me into it. Like, so he talked, he had a soda machine he was selling too. He was like, yeah, I can you this soda machine for 900, nothing wrong with it. I hope you set it up. Um, you got a location for it, you know, it's, it's yours. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna do like a soft search. Like if I find something in my soft search, I'm, I'm gonna go with it. Cause I'm not really, you know, I wasn't really like sold on it, but I don't, I'm gonna believe it like in science. Like, so if I, I, if I attempt something and it's, I see a sign that I should go for it, like I'm going to go for it. Um, so off of the soft search, I ended up landing a hotel. Right, it was a, mo a motel. I ended up landing a motel. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to do it. So I brought the machine from them. We put it in a motel. And that was my first spot. Okay, stop there. A couple of questions for you. Solitude for $900. Is that a deal or is that kind of the standard price for anybody who's thinking about upgrading and getting into the vending machine business it, it, is, is it kind of a thousand dollars what they should be expecting to pay for a used vending machine yeah around that thousand around that thousand mark i would say more like 1500 like so he was really he was selling it for like 1100 he gave it to me for nine but i, I would say anywhere between a thousand and two thousand is like that that range that they, you're going to find the machines in like the standard machines. Got you. And and that's used. That's used, yeah. Like when you want the card readers and stuff, you have to buy those separately and then install them onto the machine most of the time. Another question for you. Are vending machines like cars, right? <laughs> Meaning, okay, granted, you sold me on the fact that I can go out there and buy a used vending machine. But am I looking to be like, well, this vending machine was made in 1995. You know, it's 25 years old now. I don't know if I want to buy that. Or, you know, do these things kind of last forever? What's the lifespan on these machines? How far back should somebody go if somebody is selling them a vending machine, even if they're getting a deal? That's a good question. I don't think nobody asked me that one before. That's a good question. So um, you go too, you know, you know when you went too far back, if, you, if, you, if it's like a mechanical machine. A mechanical machine is like the one You'll put the people will put the money in and they have to like turn it physically for the stuff to come out and all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, like so I can't put an exact like years you should go back on it, but when it's it, it should look it should look at least somewhat modern. Like if it if it doesn't because it still has to be appealing, you know, to the eye, because you want you want it to be eye catching for the people, you know, walking past so they can actually use it. If it looks too old and and like, you know like busted or whatever you however you want to term that um you know nobody's going to use it they're not going to they're not going to use it as much if it was more so eye catching so i do use use but i don't use like old you know what i'm saying so I, it will be used but it won't be like old you know, if you understand what i'm saying understood okay you said you got it into this motel kashif you're a good man you've been working with the kids you've been um what, what else is you working with the kids? You have your, your, your other machines, but I got to believe it's one thing taking a, a, a gumball machine into a barbershop, but it's a whole other thing to take a vending machine into a motel. What does right. that negotiation process look like? 
So when I approached the the hotel, um, you know, they said they were interested. And then we had to have a sit down. I had to have a sit down with the manager and, you know, go over what we would come up with the uh, agreement, also known as, the, you know, the contract. So at that point, I had this guy had no contract. Your first contract? Yeah, so I had to scrape up a contract, and I ended up talking to the guy who was helping me, um, who I was getting the machine from. You know, he gave me some advice. I contacted a, um, a lawyer friend that I had, and he helped me put together a contract. So I approached them with the contract. Um, we talked about, like, price points, type of products that would be in there, so on and so forth. We came to an agreement, and then at that point when they signed the contract, I, you know, we brought the machine in. Couple of questions for you. You get this contract. What's in it? Like, is it percentage? I'm gonna give you X amount of dollars that I make off this um, particular spot. Mm -hmm. Are we talking damages? Cause obviously it's a motel, people can damage. Like what, typically what should people have in a vending machine contract when negotiating with a location? Yeah, you, you just hit the nail on the head. So. Sometimes, not all the time, you have to pay a commission, right? So you want to, the commission should be in there if you're paying it or not paying it. Um, who's liable for damages will be in there, which most of the time we're liable. Like, so we have, we, and we just cover that with insurance. We have insurance on the machines. Um, you also want to have term as far as like how long is this, agreement good for it. So most of the time we'll try to get it to start with on a, um, a two year contract. Uh, so at least we're in there for at least two years. Um, and then also you're going to have on there, this is not, this is not every time, but sometimes people like, um, if something does like if, if damages do happen to the machine or if it's not working, how, how much time do you have to fix it? So we usually give ourselves, um, a week to come out and, you know, make repairs. Um, and then also, depending on the location, they might want uh, the price points in there as well in the, in the negotiation. What do you mean the price points? So the price points for the product. So let's say we come down and we agree on the prices. Sometimes they wanted, uh, they want before before you change the prices. Let's say uh, let's say the uh, prices on Pepsi. This is actually this actually happened. The prices on the uh, all the Pepsi. Oh, oh, no, all the Pepsi, all of the sugar products in Philly went up because they had we 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 inherited what we call like a sugar tax. Mm -hmm. So every day, and it went up by the ounce. So every ounce of sugar, it was taxed by like ten cents or something crazy. So at that point, we had to change the prices, uh, the uh, the beverages and stuff. Like so, a lot of people want um want to be notified before the prices are increased. Pass. So the locations themselves actually want to be notified before you raise the prices on your vending machines? Yeah, because if we if we agree on a price, it's like, all right, well, let us know if that price has to be changed for whatever reason. Like, so, you know. We, so we, are they more worried about, and, and I'm sorry for, for, for jumping in here, are they more worried about getting their PC? Or are they saying, look, we want to keep these prices level for our customer base, for the, for the people who are walking in and out of here? All right. So most of the time, we know with vending machines, man, it's like people think, um, a lot of people think you have to pay commission and whatnot because the people are like, oh, well, you're using that electricity or you're doing this, you're doing that. Most of the time, those locations just want your service. They just want a good service for that, either for their employees or for their customers. So that's like their main focus, even with the prices and everything like that. They just want a fair price for their employees or for their customers. Like they're not really even focused on commission like nine times out of 10. Gotcha. You said insurance. I never, I guess I never even thought about this. There's a such thing as insurance for vending machines? Yeah, yeah, you get business insurance and get your machines covered. So anytime any type of uh, property damage happens, yeah, they're, they're covered. They replace it for the amount of the uh, for the volume of the machine. How often did you have to use this insurance? Once, just and that once. was on, and, that, and that was on my first location because that place got shut down. So when they when they got shut down, it was like you know they they was acting crazy in there and bust up the machine. Okay, 
So for anybody who is watching this, you would recommend get insurance on your machines? Yeah, most definitely. Is it reasonable? Yeah, it's reasonable. It's, it's really not expensive, uh, expensive at all. I mean, if you got a few machines, it might be like $100 a year. Like, it's not, it's okay. not a lot. Yeah. Not bad. Talk to me. Now you're getting into the vending machine business. That mm -hmm. first location, before we go into any of the other locations, before we go into you buying more machines, that first location, did you make good money on it? What made you decide, you know what, I should get out of these gumball machines and get into vending machines moving forward? I would say on that, on that first location, um, let's say where I was doing $50 a month with a, with a solid like gumball machine, and that first two weeks with my vending machine it was a soda machine at that time, I did, I did like $50. So I'm like, all right, well, if I did $50 in those first two weeks, in a month, you know, I do a hundred, which is double what I'm getting off for the, uh, the, uh, the candy machine. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, I keep doing it. But within, I would say, two or three months of me being at that spot, like, it went from like fifty in two weeks to, a, like, a couple hundred in two weeks to whereas though by the end of the month, by the end of that third month, it was doing like seven hundred on that soda machine for that month. Are we talking gross or net? Talking gross, so it was, it was gross and like seven hundred um, a month just off of that one machine. One machine. So typically, when you're in the gumball industry, you're doing literally fifty dollars a month. Right, and, 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 it was, and, it was, and it was cash. Like, so that's another thing that I like because it was the coins made it, it. It was difficult to carry those coins. Like they kept busting up like my bags. <laughs> you got, they got a thousand dollars in coins, and I'm going to a bank. When I would only use the banks with the uh, coin counters, and I put the coins in there, and it's jamming up, and it's, you know, it was a lot. I did it, but it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't nothing crazy, but it was, it was much easier to deal with the dollar bills than it was to deal with all that change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was another plus for me. Okay, you said you said, and then I want to move the interview forward. You said you were making about seven hundred dollars cash per month, one location, on average, and this is a. Uh, 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 a soda machine, correct? Yeah, that was a soda machine. How much in terms of dollars does it take to fill one of those machines for the month? Soda machine took me $90 to fill up. You said what? It took me $90 to fill up the soda machine. Because let's say you got, uh, it has it had 10 selections. So, and it was all cans, all canned sodas. And it was one bottle, one roll for bottle of water. So the, the water might've cost me like $5 for a case um, and all the, all the cases of soda, which they come in cases of 36, was about uh, $10 a piece. So you got about, what is it, like, 90, like $95 to fill up. It was under 100 So your net profit is six, oh, $600, $610. No, 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 no. Because I would still have to, so once that's sold out, let's say, all right, I put a case of 36 then I put a, you know, and then that sold out, right? So that week, so the, so that's another thing. The vending machines I filled up every week. Oh, so it's gotcha. Like, it's, it's not like the candy machines where I just go monthly. I had to go weekly and fill them up every week. So every week I was just selling. It was selling out, basically. Okay, nice. So now you're thinking to yourself, I really got to move forward with this vending machine thing. Yeah, so I ended up putting a second machine in there. I put a snack machine in there. Same motel? Same motel, and it was funny because the guy told me not to. Like, the guy got the soda machine told me not to. He said, yeah, nobody really buys snacks like that. I'm like, man, it's doing good, though. I think, you know, I want to try to get a snack machine in there. So I ended up ended up going for it, and the snack machine did the same exact thing. So both of them together was doing, like, you know, 1400 Nice. Real nice. Got a couple of questions for you because I want to I wanna discuss you just expanding your empire. What sells good? <laughs> you know, because you, you talked about your first machine. It was, it was a soda machine. Mm -hmm. And you also had a row of water. I'm assuming the markup on the water is a little bit, or the, or the percentage on the water is a little bit better than sodas. But yeah. if I want to get into the game, what am I, do, do I want to go into more canned sodas? And is there a reason why you don't do bottled sodas? Do I want to get into more healthy stuff like waters? It's the snack machines um, make most sense. Like, what what are the big sellers in this business? 
I would say, man, it's, it's really demographics. It comes down to your market, where you're at. Like, let's say, let's say you in L.A. Like, L.A. is a where, – where are you at, matter of fact? First of all, in New York. New York, all right, yeah, all right, you in New York. Let's say you in L.A. You know, L.A. market is different. They real, like – they go to Whole Foods a lot, like they do that. That's that's they think. Like so over there, I might I might I might really want a healthy machine, something you know where you could put some type of uh, healthy stuff in, some salads or something. I, I don't know, like you know that type of thing. Whereas like if I'm in if I'm in New York, you know, uh, I'm putting, you know, I might just go the traditional route. And then it's also what's actually in there is in the price points is going to be determined by where the machine is, like, too, because, it, all right, without, without being racist, right, so different different demographics, like, different things. So if I'm in uh, a place that has mostly uh, black people in it, right, from my experience, they like stuff with, with more flavor. So they're going to want the barbecue chips. They're going to want, you know, they're going to want the Doritos. Like, they're going to, you know what I'm saying, stuff with flavor. Whereas, though, if I'm in a place that that's more like uh, Caucasian people, they're going to want more so like the plain, the plain chips, the big stuff. Like that's more so with sales in that area. Or if I'm in like a Spanish community, they might want like the spicy stuff. Like so, it really just depends where you're at. And then the same thing with the prices. Um, if I'm in New York, a, a, a bag of chips might cost I don't know what y'all stuff costs, might dollar fifty or something like that. Whereas though in Philly, it might be cheaper. Um, same thing, if you got a location that's in a hotel, your price is going to be higher than it would be if you were in a, a barber shop. Like, you understand? So it really just comes down to where you're at and what your, uh, what your people want. Okay, so what's the average markup on a product? The lowest, the lowest markup I do is, is double. Like, so wherever I pay it, I'm, I'm charging at least double. Like, wherever I pay per unit, I'm charging at least double. And it sells? Yeah, because let's say, um, yeah, and I'm not gonna lie, like the worst, the the worst markup is like candy. Okay. Because candy might cost sixty cent, and you sell it for a dollar twenty five. That's the lowest one. The rest of them are typically higher than that. You at least like you know triple. Um, so Kansas soda costs about twenty seven cent. You sell those for a dollar. Um, you know, so peanut butter crackers might cost like. 15 cents or something like that. Each one you sell those for a dollar. Some people sell them for a dollar 25, like depending on, you know, again, depending on where you at. Um, so it really just comes down to, you know, where you at again and then what, what you sell them. Okay. Let's talk location. You're in this motel. Motel at some point goes out of business. You get jammed up there. Do you get your um, vending machines back? And tell me about the process into getting into other locations. And you mentioned things like hospitals. Um, what are the best locations for anybody thinking about getting into this business to look at? I, I, off the top of my head, I got to think a hospital's got to be a pretty good one. Hospitals probably at the top. That's probably the top. Really? The top. So, yeah, they, it's real competitive like with the hospitals. You got some companies that will go in and redo their, like, their break rooms and stuff like that or buy them flat screen TVs just to get – yeah, machines in there. So that's why the artists want to get into. Do you have any of your machines now in hospitals? No, I don't have any hospitals. Okay. I don't have any hospitals. Um, mainly office buildings, uh, apartments, motels, hotels. Hotels and motels are also like that's I would say that's right under hospitals. But hospitals are definitely the top, the top, the top locations. So so I'm assuming hotels, motels are pretty competitive. Yeah, they're competitive too, but it's this it's so many hotels and motels, whereas though in a hospital, uh, the hospital, you might only have one hospital or two hospitals in a, in a city. Like, it's not going to be as many hospitals as it's going to be hotels and motels. It's just less, less room, for, you know, up there. And most of the time, they contract you. So if, if it's one hospital and they have another one over in another part of the city, you'll end up being in both of them. You know, they're not going to use, like, multiple people. They just want to contract it out to one company and have them do all their sites. Same thing with schools, like universities, dorms, dorms. A lot of time, con uh, contract. Pretty good. Yeah, we had Temple. Um, so Temple, Temple was real, real good. Uh, you know, same thing. You know, they put you in multiple spots. But um, as far as with the with the question you asked me was, um, say that say that one more time because I, I lost it. I, th I think I was asking you just in terms of you branching out, right? 
Mm-hmm. You, you, for one, I wanted to know, did you get your two machines from that motel once they closed down? And then what was your next steps into getting into other locations? All right, for those, those two machines, I did not get back. No? So, so you lost your money? I wouldn't say I lost my money because I made a lot of money off of those machines, but I, def- I definitely lost the machines and then I cashed out my insurance. Okay. All right, so I did, like, I pulled my, I pulled my money back from them, but at the point where they were, um, and at the point where I was at that time, like, in my life, it just wasn't, I wasn't trying to deal with it. And then it, it was hard. I tried to get them out, but it was, it, was, it was too much. It was too much. I had to go through too much to get them out of there. So the city had came and uh, shut, that, shut that spot down because they were having too many issues, um, you know, with it being open. It was a crazy, I'm not going to lie, it was a crazy place, man. It was a, it was a wild place. It was a lot of stuff going on in there, which made it, which made it, a, uh, actually made it a good spot, like, for the vending machine. A lot of people were in there doing a lot of crazy stuff all times of the day, night, which was always busy. So, you know, it was just good for the machine. And it was bad for the community, so they shut it down. Gotcha. So you move on. What's your next locations? Yeah, man. My next locations were um, a high school, my old high school. I ended up, I I did the same thing I did with the candy machines. I networked, talked, told people what I was doing. So I ended up landing my old high school. Um, and I had an apartment complex that I got through doing what I call cold calling. Mm-hmm. So cold calling is one of the ways I find locations. I might pick um, a zip. No, I might. I, I pick a zip code. Like so, let's say um, I want I want a, a machines in whatever area. I'm gonna pick the zip codes in that area, and then I'm gonna make a list of the particular types of locations I'm looking for. So let's say I want a motel. I'm gonna pick that zip code. Google. Um, all the motels in that zip code. It's going to give me a little list. I'm going to write all the phone numbers down, and then I'm going to go ahead and call every single one of those motels. I do the same thing for, like, multiple, you know, multiple things. But I ended up doing – with using that method, I ended up finding an um, apartment complex. So I had I had my old high school, the apartment complex, and I had um, that hotel all at the same time before I lost the hotel. How many machines were you at at that point? Six. So you're now up to six machines. How are the yeah. machines doing? Machines are doing well. I actually, um, I, at that point, I had quit my job. Because was, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm trying to, t- I, to go. I was itching to quit, man. As soon as, soon as I started making more money than I was making at work, I, I, I was like, I'm out. <laughs> but, but what ended up happening, man, that the, the hotel closed, which was like my main, that was my main spot outside of the school. The hotel and the school really like did real well. So the, the hotel closed, and then school school obviously closed for the summer. So at that point, I only had the apartment complex left, and the apartment, the apartment complex at that time was a new construction. So I called them when they was building the building, and I approached them about, you know, having vending machines as one of their uh, amenities, you know. And so, you know, they went with it, but it wasn't that many people in there yet. So it really wasn't, you know, generating no, no serious money. So at that point, when those two when those two closed, I had to go back to work. Gotcha. Started pretty, pretty much start over. These are great Third. points you bring up. Number one, I, w- I just want to highlight something you said because I, 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 I speak to my audience about this all the time. They're always asking um, a couple of questions. Hey, I never, I don't have time. You know, I want to start my business, but where am I going to find the time? I'm working a job. Number one, there's more than eight hours in a day. Just like you, when you get off work, figure out what you can do from five o'clock to one, two in the morning. So that's number one. And then people want to know, when should I quit? You just gave the answer. When you are making whatever your side business is or whatever your business is, not your job, but when you're making the same amount of money or more on the side, that is when you know it's time to walk because you have a real business on your hand. Right. But I like where you're going with this story because some things that people don't think about, right, up until it hits them, you uh-huh. have been to machines in schools. Right. Well, schools are closed for two months out of the year during the summer. Obviously, your money goes down, and now you have to humble yourself and go back to work. What was that like? 
Man, that was hard. Because I really, I really, you know, because I, it's just, you know, once you get it, once, for real, once I got that taste of freedom, it was like, man, I, I'm not going back. But then it was like, all right, well, at that point, I still was trying to grow, but then I lost, when I lost, I lost that hotel kind of like real sudden. Like, it was like without warning. I just went there and it was like, whole thing was shut down. I'm like, damn, like what happened? So now <laughs> at that point, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. I ended up contacting the city. The city told me um, what, what, what happened. I had to contact them and even to get back in there to get, uh, to try to get the machines out. And when I even got in there, I seen that he was vandalized and all that extra stuff. But yeah, so I mean, at that point when that, when that shut down and then it was going into the summer, so the school shut down, I'm like, all right, well, I gotta, I gotta do something. Um, but on top of that though, what made it worse, I had, I was getting married at that same time. So I actually, I, I managed to save, before I even quit, I managed to save up a good amount of money. Like it was like probably like, like 20,000 at that time, something like that. So I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna take like 15 of this, use it for the wedding. And then, you know, I got, I still got more money coming in, so I'm cool. But then when I spent that money for the wedding, all that stuff started happening. So it was like, no more money was coming in. It was like, damn, what I'm gonna do? Like, so I really just, um, I, one of my jobs, I, I was I was on like the, what they call the sub list. So when I left, I didn't leave completely. I stayed on the sub list. So I had to come in like every few months or something like that. Um, so I just started picking up hours and uh, picking up work until I got to the point where I, uh, I got some more locations and I just started rebuilding. And then the second time before I quit again, I just made sure I, I was good, good. Like I made sure I had a, enough locations. I diversified a little bit. That's when I got into real estate. By that, by this time, I had got, I got an um, income property and all that good stuff. So, yeah. So by the second time I quit, I made sure I, I had a little more going on, so I wouldn't be in the same situation twice. And that was my next question for you. What are some of the lessons? Because what people don't understand is in business, it is never smooth sailing. Right. You can see somebody's wins all day. You can see the money coming in, but you don't ever see the money going out, the expenses, all of the different things. So in your case, you just show, look, I hit some potholes. I hit some bumps in the road. You figured your way out. You go back to work. You start to rebuild. For anybody who's thinking about getting into this business, what are some of the things you learned? Number one, schools are great, but they close for the summer, essentially, or or at least their attendance goes down dramatically. Are there mm-hmm. other any other highlights that you can tell people to look out for? Um, I would say, as far as looking out for when, as far as like the the avoid, I w- I would say avoid like the uh, putting all your eggs in, in one basket. I mean, that's that that's pretty much the thing I've been trying to avoid since that whole scenario. So, um, you know, even if you're, so let's say if that's kind of hard to explain. Let's say if, if I'm doing the vending, let's say I'm just doing the um, the traditional machines. Like, don't just leave it. Don't just close yourself off to only do one thing. Like, you know, so what I what I ended up doing too was I started adding additional services to my to my uh to my machines. So instead of doing this machines, I ended up doing like a coffee service as well. So I added the coffee service to the back end. So once I cooked them on a vending machine, I also pitched them on a coffee service. So let's say I got the they got the machine. Okay, it's an office building. All right, so we also have a coffee service um, for your employees. Like a lot, again, mo- most of that main focus is their employees' performance. They want them, they you know, they, they want the snacks there for them to help them stay alert and all that type of stuff. So boom, all right, we also have coffee. So if you want the coffee service, we can provide that as well. And then, you know, what I do with that is I'll buy the coffee set up the same way I do with the vending machines, and then I'll, I'll sell them the coffee, but I don't sell it to the actual uh, – people there, I sell it to the company. So the company buys the coffee for the actual uh, employees. Let, let me make sure I'm understanding this. Um, say I work in an office building, right? They have a coffee machine there and obviously, you know, you reach up into the cabinet. And sometimes they got those um, K cups of coffee. Is that what you're selling them? I don't sell, some people do. I don't sell K-Cups because you can get K-Cups from anywhere. Like, so I sell them like this, like a, um, it's like a, a bag of different brand coffees like that, that I have access to. 
Like I basically found that like just through doing research, um, Google searching. I found I found the company who had a, uh, some coffee, contacted them, and now we you know I do coffee through them. But this this diversifying like don't just stick to that one thing because you never know what could happen. Like you know what I'm saying. So sometimes places close, or um, you know the machine might be down. Or you all you always want to have some type of income coming in from very from various ways even with the candy machines like you know don't be close to doing those or sometimes they might want to um let's say if you get a laundry mat the laundry mat might want a vending machine but they might also want a a, a toy machine like a claw a claw machine or something like that yeah. they might want a massage chair like you know so diversify it don't just only be stuck to doing one thing how many machines do you own now right now i have about 20. How much time does this take out of your life? Uh, I do most of my work Mondays, Tuesdays. Mondays and Tuesdays are the bulk of my work. Wednesdays, I'll just be doing like some, you know, inventory stuff. So, you know, for the, I'll say about, what was three days? So what's that, 72 hours? Okay, let's, let, let's go back. Mondays and Tuesdays, you're doing the bulk of your work. That's 48 hours, you're going heavy. What does that look like? So since since I do everything by myself, like for the most part, um, I haven't hi hired any any like uh, drivers or anything yet. So I try to keep my route manageable by myself. At least now, I'm thinking about actually going past that. But I try to keep it to the point where I can manage it myself. Um, and I say anybody, you could definitely manage around any between like twenty twenty five machines on your own without having help. Um, but what that looks like is. I'll, I'll load up my um, my truck. So we get the car readers on the machines tells you what you need. They're going to tell you uh, what you need to bring with you, so on and so forth. It's going to tell you what's missing out the machine. So I get my reports, pack up my um, my products, load them in my uh, my van. We have the cargo vans. Load them in there, and then I hit my spots. So I'm going to my spots. I start off early in the morning because um, my thing is I want to try to get to all the spots before lunch. So I try to get the, I try to get to all of them before twelve o'clock. So whatever ones I don't get to before twelve, unless it's like apartment building or something, I don't really I'm not aiming for that with those. But um, I just hit them on that next day. That's when I hit them Tuesday, um, and that's pretty much you know pretty much what it is. Okay, so you're doing your shopping and you're also going around in your different spots, re up and reloading the machines, get collecting your money, so forth and so on. Correct. I I usually do my shopping all in one day. So I, I, I'll I buy the, all the stuff for the month off of one, one joint. Like, so I'll go out, let's say I'm buying a uh, bulk of boxes of M&Ms, bulk of sodas, bulk of this, bulk of the, all the stuff I know I'm going to need. And then I just got that in my, uh, I got that in my storage. Like, so when I'm, when I'm going throughout the rest of the month, I'm just picking from that and then going out to the, going out to the spots. Got you. Question for you. We, let's talk storage for a second. If I'm trying to get into this business and I live in an apartment, do you recommend I buy a machine and store it somewhere or should I find a space first and then buy the machine? And also, in terms of storage, you got to fill these things up. So you got to go to your Costco's, your Sam's Club. Where do you typically store your product? All right, so as far as buying a machine, I would say get your location first before you buy the machine. But, but also remember, you, you also want to have your research ready. Like, so you want to have, you want to know where you're getting the machine from, know how much it costs, and be prepared to buy it. But don't buy it until you actually get the location, mainly because of storage, like you said, and also because you don't know what type of machine that place is going to need. So machines come in different sizes, obviously different types of machines. You got the drinks, you got the snacks, and, you know, and so on and so forth. They might already have a drink machine in there. Let's say you brought a drink machine, but they already got what they want to snack. Then you got to go out and get a snack machine, right? So you just wasted, you know, some time, some money, whatever it may be. Also, let's say they have um, small doorways. Maybe you can't fit a, a full-size machine in there. You got to get something slimmer that can fit through that doorway. Like, so stuff like that. Is the reasons like you want like as a matter of fact my first example when the, when the machine didn't fit yep. if they would have if you know if they would have listened they could have just brought a smaller machine and probably got some right there but um yeah that's why I like I like getting them 
getting the machines after you've already, you know, secured the location. And I would actually wait until I get that contract back before I even before I even buy the machine as well. So your your recommendation for anybody who's even thinking about this is go out, scout your location, you know, work your deal out with the person who owns that location. Once you know you have a location locked in, then go ahead and buy your machine. But simultaneous at that time, you should be researching who I'm going to buy this machine from, right. how much is going to cost, all of that. So it can all kind of work at the same time. Right, right, right. So, you know, your locations are going to be the key, man. Yeah, that's that's really going to be um, determine how how strong your business is. Like, so the better locations you have, the the stronger um, and the better business you're going to have. It's like, so you really want to put a lot of your effort, a lot of your time into those locations because even if you put a good machine in there, you put the state of the art machine and it's not a good spot, it ain't, it ain't going to make no difference. Like, you really got to have your focus on your locations. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about location, but I want to go back to money. Um, I know I, this is kind of an open-ended question, but is there average that's, you know, if I buy a machine tomorrow, is it, I know you said your first spot, you, you, you were getting about $700 a month gross. Mm -hmm. Now that you've been doing this for a while, you have dozens of machines out there. Is there an average that each machine, good or bad, that you know, okay, every time I buy a machine, it's going to bring in at the low end this amount, at the high end this amount? All right. From, from my experience, I would say the low end would be like 350 like a machine. Um, on average, I would say it's around like 500. On the high end, the highest I've seen was like uh, maybe like 1,600 a machine. And these are gross. Yeah, so like the schools, like say Temple or whatever, uh, two machines in Temple were um, were doing it was around three thousand or something a month. Just off of that spot, they were doing about sixteen hundred each. You know, each machine. So this depends on you know, obviously it depends on where it's at. It depends on your products, all that type of stuff. But yeah, I would say on average, a good location would do around five hundred. Okay, so so on average, if somebody's trying to get into this business, they know maybe three hundred and fifty to about sixteen hundred. You gotta really hit it out the park to have that 1600 but maybe we could say 500 is, is is the average per machine yeah 500 and then you know you also gotta remember most spots got two machines like they always nine times out of ten they'll have a stack in a soda machine so you'll be doing around a thousand dollars a location gotcha. I, didn't, I didn't really think about that but you're right usually every place i go there's two at, at the bare minimum especially in hotels or in um hospitals there's always at the bare minimum two machines yeah Got you. Um, another question for you. I know you said you do not hire employees at this point. Is there a reason why? And I guess I'm asking this because, yes, you have the card readers, but part of this is still a cash business. So is there checks and balances there? Like, you know, is this a business you would even want to trust somebody to go pick up your money if they're not your family and I'm assuming you can still drive to all of your locations, but maybe one day you want to, you know, look, the sky's the limit. I might want to have um, locations. You're, you're in Philly. So maybe you go down the block, you're in Maryland, go a little further, you're in DC, come a little bit up North, you're in New York. It, is this a business that is limited to, to how far you can drive or can you expand it? All right, so I would say for for the first part of that question, um, with the with the uh, actual damn it, I was, it slipped my mind. Hi, hi, listen, you, you you don't want to trust nobody with your cash. It's a cash business to an extent. Yeah, so for the for the first part of that, like the card reader, so you want a system in place, right? So before, before for me, you know, personally. I'm just working on, I want to have my system uh, real clean before I bring somebody on right now. Before that, I really didn't want to bring anybody on because, um, like you said, it's a cash business, and I didn't really know how to track the cash like they would be picking up. Like So I could look at the machine and tell how much money it made, but I would have to physically go look at the machine. Like It, was, it would be too much, like moving around. But now with the card readers in place and other like software, 
we could track exactly what's in the machine and what's being taken out. Right, so those systems kind of have to cash be side, same. even from the even cash from side. The cash, uh, I can tell how much, I can tell how many how many coins are in there. I can tell how many bills are in there. Like, but you know, it's like you need that you need those systems in place before you can really hire somebody. And I will also say another thing we're working on is using all the same machines. Like, so right now we have I use a lot of the same machines, but all of them are not the same. So I want to have all of them the same, mainly because at least like the same like two because there's something I learned from when I was doing the candy machines. I kept buying the same machines over and over again because when it came to repairs and when it came to issues, I know how to fix them. Right. So if I'm bringing somebody on that doesn't really know anything about vending machines, I, I wanted to be real like plug and play. Like, all right, so I only got to teach you this machine. And then when you have a little issue there, then you can just deal with it while you're there versus if it's all different machines, even though I know how to mess with them, it's going to be complicated to teach this person how to change, you know, this machine and change that one and that one and that one. Like it's, you know, it's just easier if it's one full, one full system. So that's pretty much what I'm doing now is I'm making it a clean system. So when I when I am ready to plug somebody in, it should be a smooth, you know, transition. That's a great gem. That's a that's that's a, a a great perspective. If somebody's getting into the business, try to have all the same machines. You talked about maintenance. How, how expensive is maintenance? How often do these machines need to be maintained? We obviously know that you can be dealing with some kids. And I remember when we were young, we used to have the, the trick where you put the dollar in and pull it back out and get your stuff. Or you see people kicking the machines. Like, do you have to hire a company to come out and maintain these machines? Or is this something you can learn on your own? I would say... Um in the beginning, I had to hire people to come out because I didn't know how to fix them. But it's just like, you know, when when they were coming out, I just was paying attention to what they were doing, and then I, I just picked it up over time. But for the most part, a vending machine is only about four parts. You got your bill acceptor, um, your coin mechanism, which is where the coins go, um, and then you got your board, which is like the brains of the machine. And then on the uh, on, on soda machines, you got a compressor at the bottom, which makes the machines cold. Mm -hmm. The bill acceptor and the board aren't really too expensive. The coin mech isn't really too expensive. When I say not too expensive, it might be like $150. Uh, and all you do is pretty much unplug it, and then you you know un you take the screws out, pop it pops right out. You can pop another one in if if you need to change it out, you know, and then screw it back in and plug it back into the into the uh, power the little power box that's inside. Um, the most expensive thing you wouldn't want to look out for is the compressors. So the compressors is pretty much like transmissions on a car. Like if your if your transmission goes, you know, on an old on a used old car, like it's you know, you might you better off getting a new car. Yeah. Like so real similar to the machines. If you got a used machine and the compressor and the compressor goes, you're gonna end up spending spending around eight hundred to get that compressor fixed. You buy as well. Just go ahead and get another machine. Yeah, but it, 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 when you, when you're buying a used machine, are you just kind of gambling? Is there something? Is 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 there a way to check to see if this yeah, so you can have them. You can have them running it. Um, you know, before before you actually before you actually buy it. Now, and be honest with you, like most of the time, what I recommend, I recommend people going to buy machines from what I call like vending machine warehouses, which are just vending machine companies that sell vending machines. That way, you know, you get a warranty with it. If um if if issues happen. Um, they can help you fix it. Whereas if you're just buying it off of somebody off Craigslist or somebody off the street, it's like once you got it, it's yours. Like you got to figure out how to deal with it. Like so, when you're dealing with those other companies, they kind of assist you when you have issues. Versus if you're just doing it without them, then you just got to figure it out. But um, to answer that too, now, it doesn't happen for me personally. I haven't had too many issues um, when it came to fixing machines. Most of the time, it's just like quarters get stuck or dollars get jammed and you know and that's and that's pretty much the, the bulk of it is this like dollar jams and, and quarter and you know, coin jams like so gotcha what, what's the future of this business is, is is it sky's the limit because we see now they're putting all kinds of things into vending machines you can walk to an airport you got best buy stores there buying electronics there's so much number one where's the business going and number two yourself do you stick to traditional snacks sodas waters things like that or have you expanded i would say um i would say sky's the limit man because i think more and more as 
you know, as time goes on more and more, things get more automated. Like, you know, people want to, they're trying to more so just set things where they could just leave it and don't have to worry about it. I've seen CVS, like you said, like I, I've seen some real, and I'm not a creative person. Like I, I'm not, like I can see, I can see something innovated. Like I'll see something like if it's the will and I might be able to make a little change to it, but I can't, I wouldn't be able to think of, oh, invent the will. But I'll see some people really coming up with a lot of, a lot of like innovative, uh, innovative ways to innovative. change like, in the machine thing. Like, um, actually somebody I'm working with now, um, it's a company I'm working with now called uh, Popcom, right? They do a lot of, um, they do a lot of, it's not a lot, but what they do is they, they make innovative vending machines. Like they, they upgrade, they, they're putting software in the machines to make them smarter. So like one thing that's important when it comes to a location is like the foot traffic. It, the machine will track how many people are moving back and forth in front of it. Like, so it's going to tell you if it's like a good spot and, it's a lot of stuff, man. You know, even with that type of software um, that they're putting in there, you know, it, it could really go, it could really, it could really lead into a lot of different things. Like, let's say you have a, let's say you have a store or you have not, not a store. Let's say you have a clothes that you sell, right? Products. Mm-hmm. Let's say if somebody thinks of a way to uh, put their head, let's say they have the machine there and, and close it in the machine. All right, let's say if they create some type of format or some type of mirror or something where somebody could stand in front of the mirror and then, you know, the mirror would put the clothes on them, let's see, let them see how it would look, and then the, the stuff could just drop out, like, you know, if they if they decide to purchase it. That's smart. Like, so it's, yeah, there's a lot of different ways, you know, you could, they can, they could do, it's a lot of different things they could do with the machine. So I definitely think it's a, it's a big future on it. Um, for me personally, I pretty much stuck to, to the traditional route of the vending machine but i've opened up to doing um other things as far as like i was speaking about earlier like with the coffee um atm machines like anything that's automated i'm pretty much open to do i haven't tried any of the uh, custom stuff i see a lot of people doing like hair eyelashes um you know all types of stuff now cbd they're doing they're putting the mask and the gloves and stuff in there like the ppe stuff like yeah, so they're getting real crafty with it, man. I, I see them. I see it evolving, and I think it's going to keep going for sure. Are, are, are there enough locations out there? Like, if if somebody wanted to get into this business today, is there still enough location? Because vending machines are common. It's not like you know we all see these machines and we just take for granted that they're right. there. But obviously, it's people like yourself who are in the business. And you, you, I mean, just in terms of real estate, is is there any left? Yeah, man, I think, and I honestly think a lot, I get that question a lot. You got to look around you, too, because, you know, we see what we see, but we, you know, it's a lot of things, like you said, like, we don't pay attention to. Like, it's a lot of buildings that are being built every day. Like, even though it's already buildings there, new ones go up every day, old ones come down. So those are always opportunities, to, you know, there could be opportunity to slide in there, um, speak to somebody, get your brand out there and start to build your you're vending up. And also you got to think when you get one location, most of the time, from my experience, those people are tied into other, let's say if I get a school, right? If I get a school, it might, that, that school might have multiple schools within that city or they might know of um, other schools that need uh, vending services. So most of the time, once you get in the door and you do a good job, you get referred to other people. A lot of my business comes from referrals. Really? Like, yeah, so it's definitely, it's definitely okay. a lot. Let me ask you something, and I should have asked you this earlier in the conversation. You're talking about getting into schools and all these different places. Who the hell do you talk to? Like, is, is there a person at each of these locations that, you know, you should, if, say I wanted to go into a school or if I wanted to go into a hospital, are there, are there dedicated people who you, you should be talking to? Or are you just knocking on the door and whoever's there you say point me in the right direction of, of, of the person who handles this. You say you say point me in the right direction of the person who handles this. That, and that's one thing I learned. That's a skill I picked up when I was doing the marketing because one thing I was doing was I was connecting brands with, like, different athletes. And so, you know, you pretty much got to start with whoever you can contact, like, and then just work your way up. You know, work your way up. You can check on, you can check on the websites and different things like that. You'll be able to find certain contact information. But for the most part, get a hold of who you can get a hold of. And then they're going to tell you the right person to talk to, the right person to reach out to. 
Got you. Before I wrap this, what am I looking like? Obviously, you're talking real estate. It's it's all it's always about location. You mentioned earlier in the conversation foot traffic. So for me, if I'm wanting to get into this business and I'm out there and I'm looking for great locations, number one, I'm looking for foot traffic. Is there anything else that I'm looking for? Yeah, I would say it's about four or five things you want to pay attention to. So one is, um, so let's say, let's, let's say I'm doing traditional. It, it works with any any method, but let's say I'm doing traditional. So I'm selling snacks and beverages. So when I pull up to that spot, I'm looking to see are there any other stores around there that's selling what I'm selling? Like, so is any other corner stores, anything around also selling bags, I mean, uh, snacks and beverages? If not, that's a good sign. That means I, you know, I kind of have some leverage there, right? When I, once I get into the building, I'm looking to see where they want the machine located. Cause I want, I want the machine somewhere. Everybody can see it. Everybody can have access to it. So if they want it in a basement somewhere, and nobody's going to know it's there, you know, that's that's a, a strike against that location. All right, so you want it out where everybody can use it. Um, another thing I'm looking at is operation hours. How long is this place open? How many days a week are they open? Obviously, the more they're open, um, the more chances I have to get sales. And then, you know, the most important thing, though, is the last thing which you mentioned would be um, the foot traffic. So foot traffic is, is huge, like, because you don't have any foot traffic, which is, like, the people who work there. So how many employees they got and how many people they got uh, just coming in and out of the building. Those are things I, I'm paying attention to. And another thing I like to look at, too, like, it's not as important, but I, I like to check for the, the actual want of the machine. Like, the most recent location I just got was about last week. And when I went, I went to go check out the, the location to take measurements to make sure the machine can fit. Um, and when I walked in, I said I was there, you know, for a vending machine to get to replace a vending machine. They started clapping. Like, you know, they was excited. And there was a factory. So I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a good spot because, you know, they want it there. Like, so that's another thing I like to check for, make sure it's, it's actually a service that people want. Like, so, yeah. Very smart. Very smart. Because, you have dropped a ton of gems. Thanks so much just for your candor and being open and willing to 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 just share you shared so much I, I believe somebody can watch this video and know you know at least all that they need not all that they need to know but enough to get them started in this business where can people find you at um you can find me at the vendingbiz.com we're also on instagram at the vending biz as well is and that biz b-i-z b-i-z-z -Z. okay B -I -Z -Z, yeah and that's um that's across all platforms, across across all platforms of uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we have a website at the Venom Biz, and we also have uh, YouTube. Okay, one thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about: Can you please plug your book and your online courses before we end? No problem. So, I mean, anybody that's looking for more information on getting started, you can definitely check out the ebook. Uh, we have an ebook, and we also have an online course as well. Um, the course comes with the ebook and like other paperwork necessary, you know, that you'll that you'll use while getting started in the business when it like mainly like the contracts and um, you know, business proposals, that type of thing. Okay, and they can find that right on your website. Right on the website. Chief, thanks so much for dropping all of these gems. You are a true power move maker. Continue success to you. Thank you, man. I appreciate you for having me on. Thank you, brother. You be well. All right, you too. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.